I'm delighted uh, to welcome today uh, Ron Suskin here as our, our key, keynote speaker. Uh, Ron and his family's story of uh, driven uh, activism and research around the compensatory strength of those with autism and others who are differently abled uh, due to distinctive neurology and uh, sociocultural backgrounds. Um, Ron, uh, I think in, in just a very little time uh, in, in my um, opportunities to talk with Ron uh, that have mostly been over the phone, uh, um, uh, I have to admit that my own uh, uh, sense of how we build on assets uh, in individuals uh, has, has only expanded, and I, I have appreciated that already. Uh, Ron is a 1981 graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences and is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Way of the World, The One Percent Doctrine, The Price of Loyalty, and A Hope in the Unseen. And from 1993 to 2000, he was a senior national affairs writer for the Wall Street Journal, where he won a Pulitzer Prize. His most recent book, Life Animated, chronicles his family's 20-year journey raising and connecting with their autistic son, Owen. Ron, Owen, and Ron's wife, Cornelia, are also the subject of an award-winning documentary feature of the same name that was showcased last fall at the Virginia Film Festival. And in 2015, Ron founded Sidekicks, a tech startup leading efforts to build the next generation of augmentative technologies to lift and support these communities. Please join me in welcoming Ron Suskin. Get out of the way of my tech friend here. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. It's good to be in Virginia. Oh, it's spring in Charlottesville. I mean, I live in Boston now, and there isn't spring up there. It's like this big. It's over. And you know, I was thinking, just getting out of the car, how spring is just the ideal season for a 20-year-old. I mean, it's the spring of your life, and it fuses here in these hills. And um, so I'm not leaving, actually. I'm going to get up an apartment <laughs> over here. I'm not going to tell my wife, come down. You can visit. Um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, these years here, for many of us, all of us, I would conjecture, uh, are years in which you're in the act of being and becoming. Uh, you change so much. When I do commencement, sometimes I get lucky, and uh, some universities have the freshman picture on the ID, and it they don't, and it's there for all four years. So I was at a commencement recently, and I said, "Take your IDs out. Look at that person. Now uh, have a conversation with them. Can you believe that that was you four years ago? You change so much here, and when you change here, you do it in the company of these others." You're all in this act of transition and evolution, change, becoming. And that's why this place is unique in my life. And it's also unique because I, I dare say there is no place like it that carries the spirit, the energy, the essence of one of the key actors that created all of this. I mean, yes, there's James Madison. That's fine. Washington and Lee, yeah, I get that. But there's nowhere like UVA. There's nowhere in which someone who is so seminal to the idea of America, and it is an idea, still puts down his marker. Most important thing I will do in my life, he says, is this. He was right, I think. So here I learned the basic concepts. For here, we will follow truth wherever it leads, ever. We will not be afraid to follow it, nor to tolerate any error so long as reason is free to combat it. So that's what I learned here. I remember almost nothing else, actually, in any class. <laughs> That I remember, though. I mean, what more do you need to know? Because this is where I learned how to think. And then I was good. And off I went. I say this because I think it's important to create a kind of marker of this person who left here. 
because uh, this is the same person, for the most part, more fully evolved and fortunate. Uh, ten years later, you know, when I had a different life, I'd married an extraordinary woman, a woman who could run circles around me, does to this day. I had two extraordinary children. My older son, Walter, was five. It was my father's name. No one otherwise would name a baby Walter. Uh, but <laughs> And the youngest son, Owen, two and a half. You know, I was uh, different then. I wasn't nearly as nice as I am now. I was a, an American achiever of a slightly different caste, I suppose driven in a traditional way. And I see a lot of achievers in this room, and I'm sure uh, you had a similar set of influences. I was driven by a small woman from Brooklyn, about this tall, my mother, looking at me, that's no surprise. And she kind of laid it out for me early, not in so many words, but pretty close. She says, I won't love you any less if you're not a success. I just won't mention your name to other people. So, you know, <laughs> which is kind of true, actually. <laughs> you know. Years later, as a reporter, I would sit with some subject, some, usually a mom. Ethnicity is not an issue. And, and I'd say, we've been here an hour. There's a child other than the doctor. Well, can we talk about them? Sure. It's the way we are. You want to make them proud. So I did some of that. Some of it here. Some of it at graduate school. And when I got a job at the Wall Street Journal, mightily so. My mother uh, uh, moved to Florida by then. This is, we don't have a very clear sense of my religion of the afterlife, just so you know. It's a little complicated. So we just go to South Florida. That's what we do. We go down there and we <laughs> play shuffleboard forever. Um, <laughs> and my mother was living in a place called the Polo Club in Boca at that point, <laughs> named after the long line of great uh, Jewish polo stars. Uh, <laughs> I came down there, they thought I was the editor of the Wall Street Journal, and I did not disabuse them. But there was another character in the mix, and I'll just mention him quickly before I get to the life story, and then we'll get to some nice videos, um, who um, had a different set of lessons. Uh, and that was my father, uh, who Walter, my son, is named after, who was a guy of extraordinary gifts, uh, but not much ambition till he married my mother <laughs> when he got some and ended up being a life insurance man and um, and to uh, it wasn't what he wanted, but it's what he did. And it gave him insight that was valuable at a key moment when he's about 45 years old and he reaches on the night table next to his bed and he grabs a pad and he begins to write a letter, great writer, and he says, uh, I hope you boys never read this letter, but I cannot ignore what the doctors have said. My chances of survival are slim. They were zero. And he writes a letter to me and my brother um, from deep in his heart, saying things that parents so rarely say to their children or loved ones to each other, certainly don't write. I am overcome with joy when I look at you boys. I can't believe you're my sons. How could I be so lucky in this life? He says, you know, I had values in my home, and I took them out into the world. You have values from our home, and if you take them with you, you'll have all that you need, trust me. The end of the letter, the bottom of the second page, handwritten, you see, you see the the script harden, almost like the pen is pushing through the paper. It says, but one thing I'll ask of you. Life is precious, time so precious. Do something worthwhile with your lives. Don't compromise there. If you keep that the star in your constellation, everything will work, trust me. There's a paragraph before he says something that I didn't understand as a kid. Now I get it kind of as a father. And he says, uh, you boys, by the way, don't owe me and your mother anything. You've given us more of it being a presence in our life than we ever could give to you. My mother disagrees with that almost at every level. 
You owe me big, both of you. Single mother, raising you both. They're both right. So this is where I am, living this life of reaching for the stuff we were taught to want. In the little house in Dedham, Massachusetts. I was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And I got a big job in Washington as the journal's senior national affairs writer. Big job. Job you're going to kill people to get to kill 10 guys to get the job. Nice guys, family men. It's America, man. Nothing personal. May have to kill a couple neighbors too just to be safe. And then everything changed. I'm out down in Washington, a few weeks, Cornelia's like, something's wrong with Owen. So what do you mean? Well, look at him. He's, he's calling. Owen. Uh, oh, Owen. He's not responding. And he's crying a lot. He's always a happy camper, and he wasn't. And then over the next two months, his speech starts to vanish. He had about a 250-word vocabulary as a two-and-a-half-year-old, what's typical. And it's vanishing by the day, it seems. And three months in, he's down to a single word, juice. And we know something has happened. We go to a doctor. He says, no, you're out of my league. You need to see a specialist. And we do. And he... He tells us this is called autism. And our life changes at that instant, actually. You know, Cornelia and I remember it almost like it happened Tuesday. I mean, that vivid, 23 years now. We were sitting in the two chairs with the doctor and Owen on the rug looking at his hands. And when she said autism, uh, it was like noise entered our ears. We literally lifted out of our bodies. We were on a little drop ceiling, sort of like this, looking down on those two people. And the doctor, the, the, they did not leave the office with us, mind you. We left them there. We used to miss them. Not, not anymore. It took a while, though. Because we were changing. Owen had changed. He had vanished. It seemed not really. It sure seemed that way, though. But we were all changing. What was happening? We had, we had been struck in a way that brought eventually clarity. The short version of this story, which is now the movie and, of course, the book, is it the only thing Owen liked to do before the onset of the autism that he liked to do after was what all, all the kids loved in that period, which was watch the Disney animated movies. Okay. I mean, this is a big period for Disney, if you recall. You know, they had about two decades in the trough after Walt kicked the bucket. Nothing very good. And then they come roaring back in 1989 with a movie called The Little Mermaid. How many people have seen that movie? Every, every one of you, yeah. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> so all Owen likes to do is go up to the third floor bedroom in the rented house in Georgetown and watch The Little Mermaid. Every minute, Cornelia's not dragging him to every therapist, every clinician who hangs a shingle. He's up in the bedroom. Now, his motor function went to hell, autism. You know, he, went, he, he was up to the big boy cup about a year before, year and a half. Now he's back to the sippy cup. With one exception, that motor function, his thumb on the rewind button. <laughs> his brother taught him how to do it. And he's rewinding, watching, rewinding, watching. Now, this is a period of silence. He's gone, no speaking. A couple of months in, about six months into the silence, we hear a murmuring, a little gibberish. And we're like, oh, this is going to be good. It's like baby talk. Maybe he's trying to get his speech back. He's saying, juice or vote, juice or vote. Cornelia thinks he wants more juice. She gives him the sippy cup. He knocks it over. Don't want the juice. But it's noise. It's, it's, he's maybe trying to restore language. I mean, we're holding on to anything, any shred of anything. So we're up watching The Little Mermaid. 
the one thing we can all do as a family still, and there's a part, you know the movie, right? So this is easy. Ariel's our protagonist. You know her. Now, she, and, you know, she's a selfish girl. Let's be frank about it. She wants what she wants, her man, to do anything to get him. <laughs> and it's that key moment where she makes her Faustian bargain. Thank God for Faust. You can always use that. With the sea witch. She wants to become human and won't cause much a trifle, really. Just your voice. Owen oh, rewinds. Walter says, Owen, oh, just watch the movie. Second rewind. Third rewind. Cornelia grabs me. It's not juice. She says, it's not juice. It's just. I grab Owen. Just your voice. He says, juice or voice. Juice or voice. Juice or voice. And he looks at me for the first time in a year. Walter starts jumping on the bed. Owen's talking again. And Cornelia starts to cry and says, he's still in there? We call this our Helen Keller moment. Water. We see our doctor the next day. Alan Rosenblatt, lovely guy. He says, sit down. Let me explain this. He's like, uh, we call this echolalia. Cornelia's like, I hate that word. Is that what we th I said, you mean like a parrot? He's like, uh, you know, sort of, kind of. I said, why would he pick those three words then out of 90 minutes of gibberish? Just your voice. Child loses his voice. No way of knowing, but the sense is there's not cognition there. <sighs> this goes on for years. Cornelia's doing everything short of murder to get speech back. All she does is stay up at night with him and take him to therapists all day. She tells me, simply, okay, you need to make more money than any reporter in the history of newspapers, so you go do that. Other bits of gibberish, lines that we pick up that are in movies, echolalia. Owen's almost seven, he's up to a three-word sentence. I want juice, and we're delighted. Let's mention another key actor. You know, me, Cornelia, and Owen. The other one is Walter, the brother. This is the big neglected area of autism, the siblings. They're it. They're the key. They go on the whole life journey with the individual. They're living in the same present tense, generationally. No one knows them better. And we're going to vanish at some point, and they ain't. So Walter is like a lot of siblings of people with disabilities. He sees it early on, what's up, and he's like, I'm good. There's nothing I need, see ya. It's like a little character out of Dickens. <laughs> Gets emotional only one day of the year. His birthday, of course. We don't even see it. Doesn't fit our story of Walter. What's our story? He can handle anything the world throws at him, A and B. He'll never leave his little brother behind, ever. No, that story, it's, it's who we are. We're all our stories. This thing between ears doesn't even make sense of facts without narrative constructs. So, on Walter's ninth birthday, he's in the backyard. Owen's back there with him. His friends leave. Walt gets a little emotional. Owen follows us into the kitchen. We're carrying in the cups and the plate, what's left of the cake. And he looks at me and Cornelia from the kitchen, and something's going on. Something crazy. Like something bubbling up. And he looks at her. He looks at me. Bap. Then he says, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. And off he goes. It's like a thunderbolt went through the kitchen. Like, what's that? That's, the, that's a sentence, a big one, with things that we didn't see. It becomes clear. He's memorized all the movies. 50 Disney movies since Snow White in 1937. There's a lot of them. You mostly haven't seen them, but they're a lot. We've watched them. And he's, and he's using them in a powerful interpretive way. So the rest you can see in this two-minute trailer. The night I do the Iago puppet is the night Owen is in the kitchen. 
saying, Walter doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. They fudge it a little bit in the trailer. It's right in the movie. And this movie is changing the way people see a community that has been discarded. You know, we're changing. And it's a story that's helping us change. What else ever does? You know, I teach a class at Harvard Law School called Public Narrative and Justice. What do I find? What do I find when I study narrative? Human stories are the flywheel of social change. Period, paragraph, but nothing else is. So here we have one for you. There is a boy who is just like other boys. Until one night, he sees from his window a storm on the horizon. Oh, who are you? I'm Peter Pan, and you All of a sudden, at three years old, Owen vanishes. The doctor says, let me explain what autism is. Some of the kids don't ever talk again. I remember thinking, I'm just going to hold you so tight and love you so much that whatever is going on will go away. We're beginning to give up hope. And one day, we're watching the Disney animated movies. And he says he doesn't want to grow up like Mowgli or Peter Pan. What the hell just happened? And all of a sudden, it became clear to us. He's using these movies to make sense of the world he actually is living in, our world. So at that point, we began to speak to him in Disney dialogue. When did you and I become such good friends? <laughs> Whatever works to get to Owen. I've been scared my whole life of growing up. Peter Pan doesn't want to grow up because when you grow up, you lose all your magical childhood times. My hope is that he is independent enough to be able to grow older on his own. When I look in the mirror, I see a proud autistic man ready to meet a future that is bright and full of wonder. He's going to have to fall and fail. We're not afraid of that as we used to be. I just can't believe how far Owen has come. The future, I'm still searching for it. Who decides what a meaningful life is? It's like I always say. Children got to be free to lead their own lives. avalanche with parents calling from all over the world saying I get it my kids are Harry Potter kid Star Wars Thomas the Tank Preston Sturgis movies astronomy paleontology astrophysics I mean it's limitless now I see it's not a prison which we thought for many years on autism Leo Connor talks about circumscribed interest for years we called them restricted interests a little pejorative with restricted what we find and where autism is now, and we're a part of it, we're kind of leading this charge, is there more pathway than prison? If you know what to do with them, if you know how to see them. And that's the movement we're leading. I mean, it's crazy having sat with presidents and written all the big stories on race and class, the fault line issues that divide us. We're kind of leading the movement now. And it's a beautiful movement, participatory, powerfully. So the parents all call, and first they're giddy, and then they're saying, how do we do what you did? Look, I work, my wife works out of the house. I mean, we can't spend 10 years in the basement watching Star Wars. I mean, we got a jo I have jobs, we have a life. So we had to figure out what to do. After the 100th crying parent, Cornelia and I put our heads together, and in a twist where there was a moment of invention, we went out and started to collect leading neuroscientists and technologists from around the country to build, essentially, a technologically robust version of us. Turnkey, better, quicker, deeper than us, too. 
Because look, what did we not have in 1994 and 95 and 96? We didn't have this baby. We didn't have a supercomputer in our pocket connected to the vast cloud of all available knowledge. What an advantage this is. Wow. So that's what we built. <laughs> we built a new kind of technology. Simply put, it's a shapeable Siri, because the original partner was the inventor of Siri. It's one guy. A shapeable Siri you can feed and direct that uh, tailors itself to the child, with whom they can share videos or whatever they find in the vast world of all knowledge, because that's where they reveal themselves. John Gabriel at MIT, Kevin Pelfrey at Yale, what they're finding is these affinities are like telescopes. Through them, you can see underlying capabilities that are otherwise not apparent, invisible, opaque. It goes to a bigger issue that anyone who knows anything about the brain and neuroscience, of course, sees. Neuroplasticity. The concept is so big, it's like Einstein and relativity. It's taken us decades to figure out, what does this mean? It's so disruptive. It means we're rewiring this thing every day. I mean, I rewired it today at breakfast a little bit, you know. Something happened. A new neural pathway was carved. What does that mean? It means every minute we're being called upon to express the dynamism of human expression. How do we tap it? What do they tell me? Here's what they say. For every deficit, sweet uses of adversity, Shakespeare says it, for every deficit, every stressor in the brain, there's somewhere in equal and opposite strength. That's what the brain does. It finds a way. It's incredibly adaptive. The question is not if, but where. Find those compensatory strengths. Find them, feed them, and you get Owen. Now, look, Owen seems like one in a million on the screen in all the theaters in America. He ain't. He's one of millions. And those are the people who are coming to us now. And it's joyous. And so what we had to do was figure out a way how to tap the affinities. That's our word. I said, we're going to replace restricted interest. I don't like that. I'm a word guy. My Pulitzer's in feature writing, for goodness sake. But affinity, that works, yeah. It's about inclination. It's about a choice. It's about growing expertise. It's about identity. Affinity. And now that's being used in academic papers, which I love. So how do you get a sense of what they're going to get? Because what's happening now is that, is that they have an ability to go to their affinity and drink deep from very, very young ages, because it's there on the web. It wasn't that way before. You had to go to the library. You had to wait every week for the show to come on TV. And once you saw it once in the movie theater, that was it. That's over. So the key is to allow the individual to go wherever they want to go. So what we do is this shapeable Siri, a character called a sidekick. Of course, Owen names it. And he's also on the patent, by the way, which is great. He should be. He's the first guy of his profile who has been on a patent allowed by the USPTO. I think that's friggin' justice. About time, isn't it? So, this character's on the phone of the child or the individual, it could be anyone. When I talk into my phone or computer or type, it comes to in real time in the voice of the character. When they talk to the character, I can hear it. It's a mediated conversation through an entity. It's like a messaging app with a big brain and it grows a new kind of virtual assistant that tailors itself to the individual. Why? Because the flow of data through the sidekick that the person creates, we have, that we have build your own sidekick is what we're doing now. You can create your own. It's so rich, that flow of data. Social, emotional, and situational data, one to one. Not Siri or Cortana or Alexa or Watson. That's one to many. The only question they can answer 
when you proffer one, is one everyone answers in the same way. That's how they crush the million responses into an algorithm. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Keep doing that. We'll plug you into the back. What we need is the front end, which is one-to-one, -one, that's shaping itself to who I actually am. Boom. And that's why we're talking to Amazon and Facebook and everybody else. Like, this is different. You came at it from the other direction. And why? You'll love this. Well, when I was out in Silicon Valley three years ago and I started to talk about this, they're like, huh, this is different. How'd you come up with this? I said, um, well, part of it is I understand an important four-letter word that you guys out here don't get. Really, what? Yeah, they're very smug out there, you know that. Very self-satisfied. Yeah, the four-letter word is need. I've walked in the valley of need as a dad and as a reporter for 20 years. Those people you discard, oh, they're too complicated. They're needy. I want all humanity, like, you know, that I can do as an average. I, I you know, I don't like that, as you, if in case you're wondering. I said, they're us. They're just extreme versions of us. They're just out of whack. Think of it that way. I'm 50-50, they're 30-70. 60-40, some 90-10. All we do is measure the deficit, the 10, the 20, the 30. We miss the 70 or 80 or 90, the compensatory strength. And that's where unleashing. It's very exciting. And we just have it up in the App Store. It's free, of course, and people download it and use it. And the data we're getting is crazy, amazing. Everything's captured on the servers. So therapists are using it, clinicians, researchers, and, of course, parents and individuals themselves. In some ways, what we're doing is helping people help themselves by tapping big data and automation and the stuff we know that works. Look, look, what is it that works in your life? It's no different here. It's when you turn a passion into a pathway. That's what works. Now, some of you are here because you were fortunate, maybe going to a, a school like this, that someone said, hey, turn your passion into a pathway. You won't even feel like you're working. Your best stuff will be expressed. You'll get to use all your muscles. It's not just what you do, it's who you are. Well, every instance we get to do that in whatever kind of life we live, we're at our best. The twist is that this vast population of the discarded with ASD, like so many people, one out of four now, that is considered neurodivergent or neurodiverse. ADHD, OCD, dyslexia, autism, one out of four people. They have to do it this way. They often don't have a choice. This is the way they roll. They're not going to play the one-size-fits-all game and succeed. That's not their strength. Their strength is finding the thing they love, their passion, and turning it into a pathway. And boy, what a great thing to unleash. <sighs> All right, let me just finish with a little something. I talked to Owen in the car. I talked to him every day a couple times. He's 26 now. He lives in a supported independent living uh, environment. It's out in Cape Cod. It's called Life, Living Independently Forever. Look, look it's like a uh, senior center. You know, there are activities. There's a place. There's shuffleboard. Uh, there's, uh, there's activities and games. There's trips. There's coaching. Uh, there's job supports. But he's living on his own, mostly. He's in a condo. He's living the life that he dreamed of. People say, oh, well, that's fortunate for him. What about all those other kids? What is our job here? Our job is to make certain it's all those other kids and adults. And his whole journey starts when Owen challenges Cornelia and I. He's about 19 years old. And he's, at that point, grown in awareness where he sees how people look at him. 
And this kind of breaks our heart a little bit. Because he sees how they look at him as diminished. And he says to Cornelia, he says, Mom, people see you for who you are, and Dad for who you are, but they don't see me for who I am. I am more than I appear. I'm an unpolished gem, a diamond in the rough. That, of course, is Aladdin. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of a challenge to us. He said, Dad, you're a writer, and Mom, you're a writer, and see ya. Up he goes to his bedroom. Cornelia and I were up late that night saying, oh, God, should we, do we dare do a book? We'll expose our whole life to the world, and I'm already wildly exposed at that point. But this is the family. And Cornelia said in her wisdom, would a book like the one we could write, would a book like that have helped us 15 years ago when we were living in hell? Of course, that was a yes. And so our life changed. It was really the life that started in that doctor's office, but it grew into something beyond our imagination. And we have pretty fertile imaginations, mind you. And it brings us to where we are now. It's interesting because in some ways, we are Owen's sidekicks. He's a big believer in a kind of philosophy he developed. Again, I see this with kids everywhere. I say, tell me your passion. They tell me. I said, tell me what you see that I don't. Oh, Disney's easy, people say. I had a friend, a molecular biologist. He's a famous guy. I won't tell you his name. But he's like, my kid, let's call it the kid Ethan. His name is Eduardo. Not really. And he's like, I, I wish Ethan was a Disney guy. He's not. He's a map guy. I'm like, OK. So we're thinking on the phone. We're like, well, the question is, are all these affinities created equal? Are some better than others? And we're like, wait a minute. We're running into one of those neurotypical blind spots. Maps are the two-dimensional rendering of all humanity, have been for thousands of years. The cartographers were the great geniuses of their age, artists and scientists both. I said, what's a map? It's not just topography, geography. It's identity. It's your place in the world. It's who you're next to and who you're between. Every town and every map is a name, born of a narrative in every case. Tell the story. How did it happen? I said to him, I said, I said, you need to learn to speak map, Eduardo. A month passes. Eduardo's back at the phone. Ron, Ron, you won't believe it. I've been talking map with Ethan. My guys are going, oh, today, today. Today, we're talking map, and he mentions a place on a map, some city. He's memorized the entire Rand McNally World Atlas, the whole thing, every page. And he starts to describe this town, and it's on a coastline, and there's air currents that are odd. He says, this is a town that is warm when all around it is cold. This is a town that faces fierce winds every day. But it stands up to them. It is resilient. I didn't know he knew the word resilient. And all of a sudden, I realized this was my town. He says, Dad, this is your this is you, your town. He told me, I love you in map. Who creates language out of passion? Oh, that's a higher function, mind you. Owen created one out of lyrics and dialogue from Disney. This kid out of maps. Gave a speech at the Semblance at UCLA not too long ago. Young lady walks up afterward. First thing I ask, tell me your passion. What is it? It's dinosaurs. Good. Teach me something. They're never asked that. Teach me. OK, what do you want to know? Well, how about your favorite dinosaur? Try it. Start there. I don't want to tell you. Every time I say it, everyone laughs at me. Why? Well, it's complicated. Ever since Jurassic Park, I promise I won't laugh. OK, my favorite dinosaur is the Velociraptor. I'm like, OK, it's a monstrous, bloodthirsty animal. OK, what's with the raptor? Why the raptor? It tears people apart. Well, no, see, when she gets the look, you know the look, kind of the dive deep look they get sometimes. 
your neuroscientists get it too, and your mathematicians. It's no different. Philip Glass does it when he's doing his music. It's his look. And she's like, well, well, you see, they're pack animals. Now, all the animals on a pack, of course, are not the same. And if they work together, they can take down a much larger dinosaur. But the key is they need to know who does what well. And see, it's about interdependency and about how we rely on each other when we know them. <gasps> What's she doing? She's drawing from her affinity what she needs to make her way in the world. It's what we all dream of doing in the content we consume by the second. In this way, they are special. I've gone on too long, haven't I? Okay. Let's do a couple questions, and then I'll finish up with what Owen told me to say. Okay, come on. Hi, Ann. How are you? Okay, so Anne's asking, how do you fight the urge, which is strong, for them to dive deeper into their affinity when you want them to come out of their affinity? Okay, what I say, and this is borne out with lots of research, mind you. Lots of clinicians are out there doing it. You got to go in deeper. You got to go into the underground cavern. Now, now they may not want you there. You got to go in carefully because we're clumsy. We'll not go reveys, you know, we'll break the chair. So you got to go in quietly, gently, just hanging out. What is it you see in this? Hmm, interesting. Don't be too product-oriented. Try to find a way, as Cornelia said brilliantly, love what he loves is a way we're going to love him. We can't be fixing him every minute of every day. There's no relationship of a parent to a child. Owen totally gets that. Later, when he got to speak, could speak, he told us. He says, when you turn my movies into a weapon, because we were using it as a behavioral tool, you know, an aversive or reward. Okay, oh, and you want to watch Beauty and the Beast tonight, here are 10 things you need to do in school, and we have a checklist, each one of them like walking across hot coals for us in terms of sensory overload and, and, and sensory pain. After we did a little of that, he's like, you know, I don't want you to watch with me. You're not, you don't really love them, the movies. You're using them <laughs> against me. <laughs> and we stopped doing that, and he let us in deeper. And so you go in deep. This is what we do with sidekicks. Because when you're talking through the sidekick, which is a character they create, and it's in the voice of the character. Now, they know you're behind the curtain. Almost all the kids do. They, but it's, it's wonderful. They don't care because you're, they're watching the video they love. You have a mirror of that video on your phone. It's phone to phone or computer to phone. So you're watching what they're watching, and then the sidekick can proffer a question. Oh, I love what Belle does here. This is an interesting twist in math, the Taylor polynomial. Hmm. It's about the distance you have yet to the solution, isn't it? Yes. It says it right there on the screen. Get that on the internet, it's all there. And all of a sudden you see them open. They know it's you, but they know you're being mindful of how disruptive your presence can be. Nothing personal, just the way you are. And then the kids start to open up. And then they say something to the sidekick that they wouldn't say to you. And you're like, wow. We do it now. Look, we're on movie tour all year. Owen gets his own hotel room now. So he's in the hotel room, and Cornelia and I are in the other one. We're sitting in the bed, and he's talking to his sidekick. He knows we're next door. Cornelia says, hey, sometimes you get down, don't you? And he's like, yeah. It's not her saying. It's the sidekick. Sometimes you get down, don't you? It's through TTS. Yes, I do. What do you do when you feel that way? How do you lift yourself up? It's me saying it. He says, sometimes I don't know what to do. After one of those sessions, he said something extraordinary. He said, um, well, there's some other movies I'm using. Because the sidekick said to him, it was me, 
through the sidekick's voice. Uh, is Disney not too helpful here? Not much to work with? It was after, in fact, he had broken up with a girl. And it was first love, and he was wrecked. And he says, yeah, Disney's not that helpful. He tells the sidekick. All the movies end the same way. <laughs> the kiss. <laughs> All lit, no tongue, as Walter would say. <laughs> Arms akimbo, head tilted. So, so what are you using? Well, there is a scene I'm using. It's helpful. I think of it every morning before I set out on my day. Uh, what movie is it from? Sidekick ass? It's from The Dark Knight, the Christopher Nolan Batman series. I'm like, oh, God, not the Joker. <laughs> ah! Cornelius like, oh, my God. <laughs> no, no, of course. What scene is it? It's Alfred, Michael Caine, and Bruce Wayne, sidekicks and heroes. Architecture he loves. Yeah. Well, there's a scene, you know, Wayne Manor's burned to the ground. Bruce Wayne's at the bottom of a deep pit. And he says to Alfred, I've lost it all. My family legacy my future, and Alfred says, and he, Owen does it perfectly. It's like you're listening to a recording. And Michael Caine says, as Alfred, why, sir, do we fall? Bruce Wayne says, why? So we can learn to pick ourselves back up again. You never lost faith in me, did you, Alfred? Never. That came through the sidekick. <laughs> it's a bright future. We need to get out of our skin a little bit. We big brained, whatever, strong testers with nice scores. <laughs> I mean, of course, I couldn't get, I wouldn't even be waitlisted here these days, but still. <laughs> to remember how we are as people. Remember how we grow. To remember things that are easy to forget in the rush of life and our desire to help all people who are in that category of outcast. Owen finishes it all brilliantly. And again, this is something that a thousand spectrum kids, just like the dinosaur girl, could say to me. But Owen's belief is that... Um, some of the terms we use are not appropriate. Again, typical spectrum thing. They don't abide by the supposed to's. They are living devoid of traditional context of hit the bell, tell the teacher what they want to hear, get your ticket punched for the round of musical chairs. They don't do that. They think originally. They do pattern recognition. I mean, that's their strength. What is intelligence other than that, really? So, Owen believes that we're all really sidekicks. Now, when he became an aficionado of the sidekicks, it was heartbreaking for me and Cornelia. He was thrown out of a school, and he was really busted up, and he said, I'm not a hero, I'm a sidekick. And we're like, oh, God, no. He says, but the sidekick's important. They help the hero fulfill their destiny. Without them, nothing happens. Right. So now what does he say? At every screening, people ask, how does it feel to be a celebrity? And he's like, I'm not a celebrity. I'm a person being celebrated. They're different. <laughs> they are. And a lot of celebrities are seen as heroes, and that's not right because they're mostly about themselves, and I'm about everyone. So then he said it at a screening. You see, I think we're all really sidekicks at our best when we help others fulfill their destinies. And on that day, we find our inner hero. Oh. Let me just say that if Jefferson was here, he would applaud. Because what's that really saying? It's that saying whoever we are, wherever we live in the great common frame of Jefferson, of the people having wisdom, even the unwashed, even the people not born on second base, is that we all have a choice every morning to find that inner hero. And that's the kind of choice 
that has brought many of you to this room and to this extraordinary center that is now growing up, of course, in just the place it ought to, the home of Jefferson and the home of so many of us when we were at our best and are now. So on behalf of the whole gang of sidekicks, uh, find your inner hero. We'll do it together. <laughs>